Okay, we have a special episode today. Uh, I imagine a lot of you at home are trying to practice. Hopefully, if you're not trying to practice, pretty soon you'll be cordially required to. And part of that is uh, making sure that you're playing the right notes. And that's not just putting your finger in the right spot. It's also making sure the string is tuned to the note it is meant to. So we have Mrs. Rodal here, who is a real expert in uh, violin repair and upkeep. And she's going to tell us exactly how to tune our strings without breaking all of them. So, oh, I went the wrong way. <laughs> Can you stop it? I just made myself bleed. <laughs> Okay, we are here with Mrs. Rodal to talk about tuning. There's a couple of things we need to go over for today. First, how to tune with your pegs. Second, how to keep your pegs from slipping. And three, some DIY solutions for if your peg is too slippy or too sticky. So first things first, if I'm tuning with a peg, which direction do I need to start so that I don't break a string? You need to go down in pitch, which if, the violin or viola or, or cello. cello is facing you, is towards you. It should be at least, as long as so, the string is wrapped properly. And it's really important that you're, you're plucking the string while you're doing this, so you know it's going down. And then I can go back up, is that right? And you can go back up as long as you're plucking. And you want to have a tuner ready to make sure that it in fact does not go past the pitch that it should be tuned to. We're big fans of clear tune. It's $3.99 in the App Store. It's not terribly expensive, but it's so much better than the free ones. Yeah. So if I'm tuning, I'm constantly plugging, making sure this is not going to go above an A. Keep it at pitch and so it doesn't like unwind and slide down. You need to be pushing in while you do it. So a peg is tapered, and you can see it better with a cello mm -hmm. peg. Um, it's thicker here and it gets thinner as it goes in. And for, for those of you who understand functional mechanics, the, this is just a wedge that it is going in here and holding tension but then it's also like a screw that as you turn it, then it's got even more friction. And the, it's not built with that screw in, but over years and years and years of use, it does have that the same, the function of a screw. So that turning with pressure will activate both the wedge principle and the screw principle of the pit. Now, uh, disagree with me if you want, but when you are putting your strings on the, uh, on the pegs, the, the treble strings should end up wound up against the treble side of the peg box, and the bass strings, the G and D on this violin, should wound up, be wound up against the bass side of the peg box. Now, if you're in a really sticky situation and your peg won't hold, you can really make sure that the the winding is pushing the peg in more, but at the very least, if your strings are put on the peg box all cattywampus, the pressure that the peg box is being pulled in is, is really uh, poorly distributed, and this whole thing will just pop right off. I've seen it many, many times. So make sure that when you're putting your strings on the pegs, that they're going, they're wound up towards the peg that's being turned to tune them, correct? So, do you want me to show how? Yeah, how, how string goes on? Yeah. Why don't you get nice and close to the camera if you can? So, I guess, um, here, let me make. Okay, so, it's easier when you have one that's not already coiled like this. So, if you have a fresh string, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, and if it's really frayed, you could snip off like less than a centimeter. Yeah, just take like a, um, I would use your uh, fingernail clippers and just 
go clip. Yeah, just a just tiny like a little bit. Quick clip, just to really get a fresh, um, fresh start. But um, so you want to find the hole, have it ready, and you put the string in this way towards the back. Let's see if I can get get it well. And it, it may be helpful to have a friend here with a flashlight to help you see, especially the, the A string on violin or D string on cello or viola can be really hard to see. Yeah, you want it to be well lit. And if, if your instrument wasn't drilled properly, the holes may not be large enough for the strings you're trying to put in there. So really make sure when you're considering buying a new instrument that it's been made and set up by a quality maker. Uh, so that when you're going to change strings, that it, it's going to be a, a large enough hole. I don't know if you can see it, but... Yeah, it's way back in there. Yeah. And if I turn the peg here, or put the light back on, you can see kind of where the hole is. We've got a string in there just a little bit. Yeah. So, once you have the string in there, like this, you're going to start... twisting away from you like this. And what I do is I usually go this way, which is the wrong way, like we were saying, the opposite way that you should be going. But just once. Just once. Turn it around once so that there's one full loop. Mm -hmm. And then you go back over. I think about it like Indiana Jones. And when that he, makes a cross. When he goes to jump over something with his whip, that he whips at it and it goes around like three times. And that friction of being wrapped around a couple of times makes it strong enough that he could swing across. Yeah. So the going the opposite way first makes it so that when you start tightening up on the other side, that there's enough friction between the peg and the string that it's not gonna slip off of the peg. Yeah, exactly. And I'll, I'm gonna show you on the yellow one too, cause it's a little bit easier to see. I'll show you that cross. Um, but, once you get it wound around a couple times, um, go ahead and loop it in at the bottom. And you want to make sure that it gets in there nice and securely. And Otherwise, you, it'll pop out. Again, if you have an instrument that wasn't totally set up by uh, a professional luthier, if it was set up by a technician or by somebody who works at a factory, maybe somewhere in, in East Asia, uh, mass producing instruments, there's fantastic Chinese violin makers, but mass produced somewhere in the world. See, like this one is a little bit. Yeah, the, the tailpiece loops are just a little too small for the average string. Yeah, it's hard to get it through. And, and you can kind of kajigger it in there, uh, but it, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. So just make sure uh, if you're having uh, any struggles like this, give me a call or uh, I'll put you in touch with uh, Rick down at the violin shop and we'll find a solution for you that, that doesn't necessarily mean buying a new violin. As long as your tailpiece is ebony, mm -hmm. um, then it's really easy just to widen the slot. So the, mm -hmm. the luthier could do that and really easily. The, the danger here is you may have had a, a teacher, a private teacher at some point, who told you when you're putting on a new set of strings to tune past the pitch that it's supposed to be so that it'll settle in to the right pitch. Never do that because the string is only meant to hold the tension of the note that it was made to produce. Yeah. And so if, can you show us that string that we broke earlier? Yeah. So this is what happens when a string is put past its limit. And yeah. even if the string doesn't break right away, you can see all these little tiny fuzzy fibers and they, they're supposed to be in a rope, in a coil. And so even if the metal of the string doesn't break, that rope coil is broken. And that's what you're experiencing when you are trying to tune your A string. And sometimes it sounds like A, and sometimes it sounds like G, or it sounds like three notes at the same time, and you just want to smash your violin on the floor. It's just the, the string has gone what we call false, and it's time for a new string. Yeah. Um, so here's that, here, I'll show you that, that cross that I'm talking about. So. You can see that at this end over here, that it's 
it's still kind of hard to see, but it's crossed over once, mm -hmm. and that helps hold it in place. So that's what I was talking about. And, and I gotta apologize for all the yawning. I'm not bored by this. This is very entertaining. It's just, you know, eight o'clock in the morning here. Yeah. Um, also, when when you've got everything uh, mm -hmm. in, make sure you line up the string in the slot in the nut and the slot there at the bridge. And is there something we need to do to the those slot at the nut in the bridge before we put a new string on? You could, yeah. I mean, if there's... So just a little bit of graphite from a pencil. This is my favorite pencil. It's called a black wing. They're not too expensive these days. They erase great. They write dark. And it's just, it's kind of like a lubricant so that the string slides more easily and doesn't because it can actually unravel at the nut or at the yeah. bridge if there's too much friction, then that outside, rather than the core this time, would actually start to unravel. And especially for our cello friends who spent over $100 for their set, if you start to uh, see the, the string is kind of uh, getting lines on it right at the bridge, that means it's getting stuck on something on the bridge as you're loosening and tightening and loosening and tightening. So that graphite helps keep it moving smoothly, but also so the string doesn't break. Yeah. Uh, now, if we are to tune uh, not just one string, but to replace a whole set of strings, like in my syllabus, I think I suggest you, you change out your strings once a year with a synthetic core string. Except for basses, basses, uh, synthetic core would definitely be out of your price range. Okay. And there's some some great uh, steel core, rope core options for bass. But uh, with the exception of A strings for cello and viola and E strings for violin, you got to have a synthetic core. It stays in tune longer, they last longer, and they sound a million times better. And it's really important when you're practicing that you can hear yourself making good sounds. And, and there's some affordable options. I think Tonica's, uh, which is a Parastro label for a uh, violin, you can get a new set of really high quality strings for $25 right now. And don't go to the music store, go to Amazon or eBay. Or if you like to support your local businesses, then you can go to a music store. Yes, but don't go to a music store. Yeah, the go to the violin Yeah, shop. go to the violin shop, uh, tell uh, Rick what you need, and he'll do his very best to set you up. And if you go to a violin shop, yeah. and like I like a, a gold E string, but not just any gold E string, I want the obligato gold E string, and I want the Passion or Vision Solo G, D, and A, and I don't want to pay the separate string price, usually the violin shops will give you the set price for that piecemeal. So yeah, for cello, cellos, they want the Spiracore C, usually, Spiracore Tungsten C, C and G usually, and, uh -huh. then, and the, then Larson DNA. Yeah. And if you sure. tried to buy those online, you're looking at two, three hundred dollars. But a violin shop might understand, or a luthier might understand that that's the set the cellists use, yeah. and they might be able to provide you a, a a wholesale discount on that set. Maybe potentially, um, but the added value also, even if you're paying the same price as internet or even a mm -hmm. little bit more, is that the shop will go through and make sure that the graphite is in there and make sure that your pegs are loose. All and that, stuff. that this little doodad on the inside of your instrument, let's see if we can get you a shot. You see there, can, Sam, can you point down to the bottom? It's called the sound post. There's no glue holding that in there. It's just tension between the top and the bottom. And among other things, it supports the 100 or more pounds of pressure between the top and the back uh, from the bridge pushing down with the strings, uh, but it also transfers vibrations from the treble side of the bridge all the way up to these pieces of wood and all the way down to these pieces of wood. And a really good luthier has a channel that takes them around so that this little tiny piece of wood vibrates like the subwoofer on a speaker to create even more sound and overtones. So if that sound post isn't set right, not just isn't it transferring those sounds, but also that it, it needs to be totally flush with the top and with the bottom. And if it's sitting at an angle like this, now that's 100 or more pounds of pressure 
on a very small point, and that makes what we call a sound post crack. And tell us about how detrimental to an instrument's life a sound post crack can be. Well, um, because of the um, critical nature for the sound that a sound post has on an instrument, the instrument will most likely not sound the same after a sound crack repair. Even if it's done professionally by the best possible person. It just won't, the sound won't transfer as well. Um, also, it is extremely expensive. They have to take the top of the instrument off to do a proper sound post crack fix. And sometimes and, they scoop out a piece of wood and put in a whole new one altogether. That's, that's the correct way to do it. Um, and that will cost more than a lot of, yeah. It, it could, yeah, it could cost much more than the instrument is worth. Of dollars to do it. Yeah. And then instead of the vibrating all of the fibers vertically, uh, at least on the top of the instrument, now it's either vibrating a strip of glue that isn't very reverberant and it's not sending the vibrations all out the instrument or if you have a pat, a soundpost patch made, it's just vibrating that one piece of wood. Kind of a dead spot and then it doesn't. Yeah, happen. and so if you play maybe a, a, a relative's instrument that has had this kind of repair done, you might notice that it sounds kind of muted or there's something missing or it's a good violin, but it sounds uh, like it's seen better days. And that's usually the sound post cracked. So make sure that your sound post is always up and down like that. And if you can take your instrument uh, to, to me, your teacher, or you've got a private teacher or to the, the local violin shop, they will move that sound post around for you as they're tuning the strings or tune the strings in such a way that the sound post isn't gonna move. Yes, so if, if you just do change the string one at a time, then mm -hmm. you're, most likely not gonna. Yeah, so don't take all of your strings off when you get a new set. I know how exciting it is to get a new set of strings. I love nothing more in life than changing out strings to hear what a new set of strings sounds like. Uh, but I always start with the A, no matter what instrument it is, bass, cello, violin, viola, because uh, A is sort of the most neutri neutrally uh, tense strings, uh, because even though it is a higher pitch string on violin, it's usually a, a, a lighter gauge string. So it's maybe producing the same amount of tension as, as the D or G strings, which are much thicker and higher tension. So by changing the A string first, that's sort of your safest bet uh, for keeping tension even. And then I go lower first. Uh, so I tune, reach in the D and then the G on a violin. And I come back for the E. Because the, the E does have the highest tension, but by tuning everything else first, the taking the E off will have the least amount of impact on the rest of the violin. And same thing for cello bass, do A first and then go down, and bass you'd have to go back up for D and G after you've tuned A and E. But bass is a whole different ball game because you have all the- Yeah, it, it, I mean you need power tools to tune a bass. You gotta get a drill with our special fitting unless you want to spend all day just cranking that thing down, uh, which I have done and is probably why I am the way I am today. Yep. Was well, there anything else we need to know about tuning at home? Um, have we talked about tuners yet? Not really. Well, because the whole time that we were here tuning, we have, can you bring up our favorite tuning app? I think we did say that. Yeah, well, that was in the video that we didn't record. So our favorite app is called Clear Tune. I think we said that a few minutes ago. It's a great, great, great tuner. It's highly accurate. And the cool thing is, is if you're a nerd like me and you want to tune your harpsichord, you can set it to the Kellner tuning, which is the, a different system of tuning uh, for harpsichords and organs. And yeah, it shows you all the different tunings. Uh, in, in orchestra, we, we say we tune to uh, equal temperament, uh, but that, that's really not the case when we get in the classroom. If you were to take a tuner to the, the, the best, most professional uh, performances, they're not playing perfectly in tune with equal temperament. Each chord has to be tuned a different way. And the uh, example I always like to reference is that an F sharp and a G flat on anything other than a piano 
are not the same notes when you're tuning them in a chord. And that's because really we're working on, on something kind of like whale, tep whale temperament or uh, the Kellner tuning in an orchestra or a choir. So everybody has to adjust all the time. Uh, and what you're looking for is for the overtones to start ringing. Here at, at, at school, I've got a bunch of different instruments laying around here. And I know I'm in tune when I'm tuning my D strings and all of the instruments around me start singing. So whatever the tuner says, is that if I can get the, the, the ambient resonance of the room to start singing, then, then that note is in tune. Uh, anything else about string breakages or accidents that we need to look out for? Yeah, so we didn't actually talk about the bridge. Um, so the bridge, if you're tuning a lot with the pegs, can start to lean forward. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not good because then it could fall and slam on the top. We already did that. In this video? Yeah. Okay. We, well, we graphite. Didn't, you need we didn't graphite. actually go through tuning. Um, so we'll get to that. But um, you want to make sure that it's perpendicular to the top of the instrument. Um, and so if it's really bad, then it would be best to just take it to a professional because um, it can be kind of tricky to, to pull it back. Or if, if you've got an adult that was an orchestra in high school, I would maybe trust them to watch this video all the way through and make some gentle attempts to, to move a bridge. And, and Mrs. Roberto is going to show you how to do that safely. Yeah. So but you, this is not, not for kids, not for somebody who hasn't been playing at least more than 10 years. Yeah. So you want to get as much contact on the bridge as possible. So I have pretty much all of your fingers yeah, on all there. my fingers on the bridge. Um, and I just pull back slightly. And it, it, some, it, with all this pressure, it does take a little bit, a little bit of force. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you just pull back slightly and then check it again. And then there we go. And you want the back. The back is the one that is perpendicular mm. to the top. Because the front yeah, the of the front bridge is, is kind actually of on a, on a, a slope. Bit. Yeah. The so back sure is straight the up and back down. The back is straight up and down. And if you're tuning a violin from like, let's say you open your case and all of your strings are loose. You might even want to just do a little bit at a time. You might even want to get your, your bridge to a point where it's uh, leaning back towards the tailpiece like that. Slightly. So that as you tune it up, it'll just naturally pull forward. Now, I don't think in this video, because we, we did another one where it accidentally didn't record, um, I don't think we actually went through the tuning part. So, when we're tuning. Um, so just to follow up there, see how the, the, the feet are still a little bit not touching, and, but it's still back towards the tailpiece. That's much easier to fix and just push it forward just that little tiny bit. And now, and now it's perfect. You may notice on your instrument that it's still leaning back a little bit towards the tailpiece, but the important part is that the feet here are totally flush with the top of the instrument. So, uh, I'm pretty sure in this video we haven't actually gone through. This I think we did, but let's do it again. Maybe we did. It's okay. Let's do it again. Okay. Just, uh, yeah. So, so what's the first thing I need to know when I'm tuning with pegs? Always tune down. Always tune down. And that's because some sediment or stickiness or, or God knows what can build up in that peg. And if you have got a lot of resistance and you're trying to break whatever that sediment is and you're tuning up, when you do tune, it's gonna tune you know, a, a mile instead of an inch. And that's when you get that breakage of where's our, our buddy. So that's what's happened when you try and tune up. So always tune down first and then tune back up to the correct pitch. So, go. I'm always plugging to make sure it doesn't go over that. And I was doing it by listening um, and tuning in fifths, but um, you should always be watching your tuner also to make sure that it doesn't go past in this instance an A. And, and if you're using a clip tuner, that clip is meant to go on your stand, not on your instrument. 
because it's getting weird vibrations from the other strings that are resonating doing nothing. And you're probably clipping it onto a peg that you need to be able to use. So clip the tuner onto your stand so that you can uh, watch the tuner as you're tuning. And just know that they're not a very complicated piece of technology and it might take a second of silence and then you're playing again for them to register the correct pitch. And as I'm doing this, because it's tapered, I'm really pushing in. And mm -hmm. most of the time I would say that people that are just starting to tune with the pegs don't They don't know how in, to push hard enough. Push in hard And the enough. same so, is true when you're, you're tuning with pegs while bowing. You can see I'm, I'm tuning my D peg, but I've got my pinky here on the other side. And I'm pushing between these two fingers. And on the other side, if I'm tuning the A string, I've got my pointer finger. So it's a little bit sharp to me. You can actually just wiggle the string a little tiny bit and lower it just enough if you're close. But always have a finger on the other side of the peg box to keep tuning if you're trying to tune the pegs while bowing. But we suggest you just start plucking and dealing with the pegs. Yeah, that's you, one less element. You think we covered it? I think pretty much. What are any other uh, tragedies that happened at Hammond Ashley while you were working there? Hundreds. Hundreds? But How many of them were simple fixes that could have been fixed if they had just been patient? Well, it depends. There were a lot that were, you know, just little things that if you're patient and, um, yeah. But there were some that were true accidents. So at, at, what, at what point do my kiddos need to call me or call the violin shop? What, what kind of things are pretty calm and they can fix right away? And what things are, you know, danger, Will Robinson, you need to call emergency services right now? Well, I would say um, if, if the bridge is completely down, it's definitely best to take it into have a professional put it up because there is a specific spot that the bridge needs to be mm -hmm. in and you want to make sure that it's facing the right way. It's not flipped around. Um, sound post, if the sound post falls down, that's obviously something that you should have a professional do because it is very difficult to put up. Um, if there's a crack, get it fixed as soon as possible. Um, yeah, but other than that, basically what we said in the video with strings and peg fixes, that's mm -hmm. probably something that you could do at home. And, and if, if dad or mom or uncle thinks that they can put your violin back together with a little bit of glue, understand that we use a really specific kind of glue to glue these things together, especially for things like the fingerboard that we actually want to be able to come off again. Mm -hmm. So if you glue it down with um, well, even, even wood glue. Even wood glue it might not come off again. Mm -hmm. And even if it does, you might get charged extra because it's gonna take a lot of extra time for the luthier to take it off, clean it, plane it, and then rehash it out. Uh -huh. so that it and and if you're, you're in a real emergency, there is a shortcut that I can share with you, but not right now. Uh, so if, if you're in that place and the violin shop might not be open again for a, a month or two, and your son or daughter really wants to play, uh, I, I can give you some suggestions, but for the most part, it's got to be animal hide glue, and it, it's probably got to be done by a professional. Anything else? I don't think so. That's pretty much it. Well, if I'm a kid and I'm bored at home, what should I be doing? Practicing or playing for fun. Yeah, well, and at this point, it's really all playing for fun. I don't know if you guys saw the podcast with uh, Dr. Utes, the first podcast, where he was talking about how um, even though we can't play together right now, maybe some of the elements that we apply from this podcast and things that you learned this year, maybe we come back in the fall or I'm really crossing my fingers that we'll have a performance at some point over the summer uh, that we'll come together and wow each other with how much better we've gotten. So you're, you're at home, there's not a ton to do if you're not you know, working. Um, just take that time to practice. Think about how much time you've spent playing Call of Duty or, or just watching Netflix and take 
thirty percent of that time uh, to playing. And or you, if you're li or if you're playing Call of Duty, you could be listening to some music that you want to play. Yeah, listening, listening to, to music, music counts as practice, absolutely. And it doesn't have to be the classical music that Mr. Rodal likes. Find a kind of classical music that that you like, and try and think of some musical reasons why it's interesting to you. Is it the form? If it's a song with words, is it the lyrics? Um, is it the key? Uh, just dive a little bit deeper. We have all this time to think about those, those deep thoughts that we just don't have time for during the year. So do your best to take advantage of the opportunity we have here to become better musicians so that when we come back together for rehearsal, we can wow each other with all of our, our, our awesome skills and the progress that we're making. And if you want to be like a real music nerd, you can also do music theory. There's a website, musictheory.net. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's lots of lessons on there. You can learn the mechanic, like the, the theory behind how music works. And, that, uh, and if you get into college and you've lived a pretty good life and you're finishing up college, you can marry another music nerd so that you're not alone in your, your music nerdity. That it's, it, well, I, I don't recommend it for everybody. Bye! <laughs>